Amen. How he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. You know, I wanted to, to point out this uh, stained glass up here for just a moment. If you see the stained glass, it has uh, Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. And we're going to talk about both of them this morning some. And I thought, what a great tie-in. What a great picture. I wish it would change every week uh, to a different... No, I, I love this picture, but it uh, really ties in well with what uh, we're going, where we're going today. We're going to be in John chapter 10, and if you have your scripture and want to open up to John chapter 10, you know, today I want to encourage you. This morning, I want to encourage you. I want to give you hope. I want to uh, point you to Jesus. And I want to challenge you to deepen your obedience and your walk with Him. I know this is, uh, uh, you know, as it's been said, I, my job today is to uh, comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And, um, you know, we usually don't have to live very long on this earth uh, in life before we experience rejection by someone. You know, it it, uh, it affects us, and, and, you know, some parents I know, uh, present um, uh, company excluded, they felt rejection and failure and guilt when their daughter moved out saying, I don't like this lifestyle, I want to live my own life, I don't see things the way you do. And they, it was very hard for these parents, and maybe they were partly to blame, maybe they were not as guilty as they felt. But in either case, they felt that the one they loved had rejected their expressions of love and refused the advantages that their home offered and settled for what they thought was something less. And um, we need to understand that this is and has been the story from the very beginning of God's rejected perfect love. As humanity, we don't want His love, and we reject His love over and over and over. A couple of things that we need to understand in, in my message this morning is, one, there's, there's two people named John. Okay, I don't want to be confusing. I want to be very clear. There's John the Apostle, Peter, James, and John, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who wrote the book of John. Okay, and then there's John the Baptist. But rarely does John the Apostle add John the Baptist when he's talking about John. But I think that if he was talking about himself, he would say I or me or that kind of thing. But most of the time when he mentions in the book of John the name John, he's talking about John the Baptist. Okay. I just don't want it to be confusing for you this morning. If we're looking at chapter 10 in John, you have Jesus who has been teaching. He healed the blind man who was born blind in, in John chapter 9. And in chapter 10, he talks about being the good shepherd. He talks about being the door where the, the, those that enter the sheepfold. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And then in verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. Well, at that, these Jewish leaders, they picked up stones in order to kill him with them. They wanted to stone him to death. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, which good works that I have done of my father are you stoning me for? I mean, really, you know, healing people, taking care of people. And it says that they, uh, verse 39 says, therefore, they were seeking again to seize him and he eluded them. And so John, the apostle, he concludes this section about Jesus' public ministry by reporting <laughs> that Jesus left Jerusalem and he, he went beyond the Jordan where John the Baptist was first baptizing. I think this is huge. See, by this time, John the, uh, the Baptist had already been executed. They, they chopped his head off. He was beheaded. 
And so by this point, John the Baptist had already been executed, but the effects of his ministry were lingering on. And we're going to read in verse 40, 41, and 42 of John chapter 10, and and we'll stop there. But let's read together. Verse 40 says this, "And, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him, this is Jesus, many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, no miracle, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Loving Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you uh, for putting it on John's heart to write this uh, word, this book for us. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit, even now, will illuminate it for us, that we would see the truth. And Father, that that your Holy Spirit would apply that truth and convict us of truth in our hearts and in our lives. Father, I pray that we would be pointed to Jesus this morning. Father, we love you. We ask that you would give us the courage to respond to you. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we first encounter John the Baptist's witness, remember, if you're, we're going to be in John chapter 1 a little bit here, so if you want to turn there as well, John chapter 1. This is the, the first we encounter John the Baptist's witness, and it's in John verses uh, 6 through 8 in chapter 1. It says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. We know him as John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So understand, the very first part that we meet John the Baptist, his job, he was sent to be a witness and to testify about the light, about Jesus Christ and who he is. And then in verse 15, it says, John testified about him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. See, I think that's interesting because John testified here about Jesus. And although Jesus was six months younger than John the Baptist, the prophet uh, recognized Jesus as being preexistent. That he came from heaven, that he existed before I did. And I think this is huge because there follows an extended uh, section here where the Jews had sent um, people to John the Baptist and said, are you the Messiah? And they're asking him if he was the, the Messiah, which he denied. John the Baptist denied that he was the Messiah. Rather, he identified himself as the prophesied forerunner of Messiah. And I think that's huge because pointing to Jesus, he proclaimed, if you look with me in verse 29, he says, uh, the next day he, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He points to him as being the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Messiah, not him, but but Jesus as being the Messiah. And after stating that Jesus would be the one who baptized in the Holy Spirit, verse 33, he says, I did not recognize him, meaning I didn't call him to attention or or I did not recognize him as the Messiah. But he who sent me, the one who sent him to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And John added this in verse 34. He said, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist testified that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And later when some of John's followers were concerned because of Jesus' growing popularity, John stated that Jesus was the bridegroom (laughs) and that he was only the best man. I love this. It's uh, in 3, 
chapter 3, verse 29, he says, but he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. full. And then he said, but he must increase and I must decrease. What a statement. You know, Jesus told his Jewish critics in John 5, 33, he says, you have sent to John. You have sent people to John. And he said, and he testified to the truth. So let me just say, if, if John the Baptist was mistaken about who Jesus is, then Jesus is also mistaken. Because he affirmed the truth that John spoke. He testified to the truth. But what I want you to see in this passage in John 10 is this. John never performed a miracle. John the Baptist never performed a miracle. But he testified faithfully to the truth about Jesus. See, the result was that even after John was beheaded, these people in this region, they believed John's testimony. And through him, they came to believe in Jesus. You know, Jesus said in Matthew eleven eleven, he said, Among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't do any miracles. He didn't do any miracles. And that was the verdict of the, of the crowd. But evidently then, it is indeed possible. It is indeed possible for us to live a great life without doing miracles. There is none greater than John the Baptist. I think this is huge because in the judgment of the world, you know, whether it's our birth, where we are born, or our, the wealth, or, or genius, or maybe deeds of valor, or even statesmanship, they're considered essential for living a great life. To live a great life. And many times when we seem like we can't achieve those things, then we get a, an attitude of apathy like we don't care. That well, I just don't care about that, or we're just not content. But look at how little understanding we have of a great life, of true greatness. I mean, just think about this. The most beautiful human lives in our society have bloomed from hidden roots. They weren't born famous. They weren't born whatever. But you know, it, it comes from underneath. It's hidden those who have enriched the world have said with the apostles, silver and gold have we none. I mean, genius has maybe even overtaken and passed by by slow and steady patience. Here's the crux. True greatness is doing the chosen work of life from the stage, from the platform of a great motive and in cultivating godly integrity and character. True greatness. I mean, John the Baptist never thought about whether he was living a great life or not. He wasn't concerned about whether his life was great or that other people were going to think that he was great. That wasn't his issue. His only aim, his single focus, was to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit of God and to do his will. Just simply to do God's will. See, as the announcer, it was his job to raise his voice in rep repeated proclamation of the king. <laughs> you know, to carry out the task for which he has been sent and to do it so as to please the king. That was his one goal and to do it undaunted undaunted by the threats and unfascinated by the praise of the world. But I contend and submit to you this morning that that is what made him truly great. 
He didn't care about what the world cared about. He cared about what God cared about. God was the one who sent him. And he had an audience of one that he wanted to please. And the lesson is for us all. The true, real greatness of life is within your reach. If you will only claim it by the grace of God. See, John's legacy is a great legacy that to leave behind. Tell people the truth about who Jesus is so that they can come to believe in Him. What a legacy. After He was gone, people believed in Jesus, not because He was a great man, but because He told the truth about who Jesus is. See, we're like the binoculars at the Grand Canyon that people are looking at that are fixed on a point of of interest. You see this vast greatness and it's hard to focus in, but those binoculars focus in on something that is so spectacular that you should see. See, our job is not to point people to us, but through us to point them to Jesus. He's the one. So listen carefully. These words that Jesus spoke, the works that Jesus did, I think this is big. The works that he did, his person, and the testimony of John the Baptist all give us sufficient reason to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of God. But understand this, the response is not automatic. Jesus was rejected in Jerusalem. This bastion of religious cultural activity he was rejected by the religious leaders in jerusalem even though his works his words his testimony the testimony of john all proved that he is the son of god but he was rejected in jerusalem see john the apostle had this in mind in his introduction when he wrote in verse 11 he said Jesus, he came to his own and his own people received him not. I mean, isn't that sad? Jesus came with understanding, with forgiveness, with compassion and new life, and they did not receive him. The stubborn resistance of the Jews had reached a breaking point, and Jesus went away from Jerusalem and he crossed the Jordan. See, every person who has ever seriously witnessed to others about Jesus has had some kind of taste of this rejection. You know, there's a group of us that meet on Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. for prayer. You're welcome to join us if you want to join us. Every Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. for prayer. We come together, we kind of report on our witnessing experiences during the past week. We share prayer requests, we gain power for ministry for the coming week. You know, a while back there was someone had, uh, had shared their disappointment about uh, sharing Christ with a friend and the, and the person didn't want anything to do with it. And someone else in our group spoke up, reminded them, you know, Jesus experienced rejection too. Jesus experienced rejection too. And the saddest part of the story is personal. Because all of us must admit that we too have often rejected Jesus. Oh, we're horrified at the thought of maybe nailing him to a cross. But we still reject him over and over We reject Him when He offers to help make our decisions. We reject Him when He wants to comfort us in our sorrows. I got this, Jesus. I just want to have a pity party right now. I'm sad. Don't come to me with words of comfort and joy. We reject Him when He wants to help us lift our burdens. See, we flat out reject Jesus. So where did he go? Where did he he head off to when he left Jerusalem? 
I submit to you today that he went to a place of holy and fond memories. You look at verse 40, it says, And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. You know, Jesus likely remained there through the winter months. It says in verse uh, 22 that, that he was there around the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter time. And then if you look after the, the uh, rising of uh, Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, uh, verse 54 and 55, it began to be Passover season. So there's a, a period of a few months there where he probably remained beyond the Jordan. Now, not only should we learn a lesson from Jerusalem and not reject him, but we should also learn a lesson from Jesus and return to sacred experiences in our past. Can you imagine Jesus going back out there, seeing the river, seeing the place where John was being that testimony of who he was, seeing maybe the place where he was baptized, where Jesus was baptized, going back to those fond memories. Early on in his ministry, he went back to the place where his, where his ministry began. I think about that song by Cochran and Company. It says, take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. Jesus, upon rejection, he went to a place where he had sacred and fond memories. You know, we think about that today. It might be a joyful worship experience to go back for each one of us. I mean, you think about sometimes all of mother's children and grandchildren come home for the, the family reunion and they attend church together where the children and grandchildren may have been taught the Bible where they had first publicly professed Christ as their Savior, maybe even where they had been baptized. And they, they come together there and they worship together and it's a high and holy experience. So I want to encourage you, go back. Go back to your early experiences with God. I mean, if you can't go back there literally, go back there mentally and spiritually. And this is what I want to encourage you to do. Remain there long enough for the renewal that you need. You know, I imagine Jesus sat on a rock there on that riverbank and probably wept thinking about all that John had done. His cousin, a little bit younger, a little bit older than him, excuse me. But they were in ministry and, and you know, he was the forerunner of the Messiah. Jesus went back there where his ministry began and we should too. And you know what? You might, you just might hear a great testimony. Jesus did. Jesus did. <laughs> Verse 41 says, many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. I'm reminded of a pastor's wife who, <laughs> she showed her husband a, a church bulletin from a former pastorate. And in that bulletin, there was featured a deacon of the week, and he recalled with great joy the remarkable progress of this deacon that he had made over this five-year period. You know, he, he was a deacon, and he became a school teacher, a Sunday school teacher, a chairman of the deacons, a member of the building committee, and, and, and was really on fire and became an evangelistic witness. You know, I can think of many of you that I have seen grow over these past years and how God is using you. And with tremendous joy, I think about that and the love in my heart for you about that. It's like, wow, they are really doing it for Jesus. They're getting out there. They're sharing their faith. They're talking to others. I mean, Jesus must have rejoiced in remembering John the Baptist who had said, he must increase and I must decrease. 
I would submit that he went back to a warm reception. Jerusalem had rejected him, but he was received warmly across the Jordan. I mean, it's, it's common for us to want to give up after a disappointment when we share our faith. But the next effort may be just as rewarding as the last one was disappointing. You know, one evangelist, he said this, he said, I've spent several years conducting 30 evangelistic campaigns a year in, in as many different churches. And he said, sometimes the biggest disappointments were in places that seemed to offer the best opportunities. And the greatest rewards were found in those least likely places. You know, if God can use me, he can use anyone. He can use anyone. Verse 42 says, many believed in him there. <laughs> you know, in the same passage that John the Apostle wrote, his own people received him not. In verse 12 of chapter 1, he said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, <laughs> even to those who believe in his name. I mean, we're saddened when we hear about people who reject Christ. But we must not give up in despair. You know, it's been my experience in personal witnessing that when you get rejected by two or three people, that for every two or three people who reject that witness, one will receive Jesus Christ. So if you keep sharing, you're going to see a harvest some people who reject Jesus today will receive him tomorrow. I mean, these people heard what John said and it said they came to him and they were saying, you know, everything John, John said about you was true. And it says many believed in him there. I believe that in Jerusalem, there probably was quite a few that received Christ because of Jesus and his witness on the day of Pentecost after he had been crucified. You know, Galatians 6, 9 tells us and it encourages us. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. But there's some practical lessons here. And first, I, I want to say that you may never live to see how God uses your witness. I mean, think about John. He preached his heart out. He was baptizing people. A baptism of repentance. He probably never saw some of those people that he preached to make a decision for Christ, but they did. You should faithfully try to point people to Jesus anyway. Even though you may not see how he uses your witness. Second, I would say this. We need to learn how hard the human heart, apart from God's grace, really is. These Jewish leaders, they had more sufficient reasons to believe in Jesus but rather they were intent on murdering him. So when you get opportunities to tell people about Jesus Christ, pray for them and pray that God will soften their hearts and will open their blind eyes so that they can see what God is doing through Jesus Christ. Third, I would say if some reject your witness, don't give up. Don't give up. You know, some seed falls on the road and it never sprouts. Some seed falls and it sprouts up, but it quickly dies because it has no root. And other seed, it, it sprouts up and then it's choked out by the weeds. But some seeds hear the word and they bear fruit for eternal life. So keep sowing the seed. Keep pointing people to Jesus because he is the Lord. As I wrap this up, I want to say this. Don't, don't wait around. Don't wait around for an attempt to wade into something super big or great to do. Because you just might waste your life waiting for an opportunity that may never come. But because the little things are always claiming your attention... Do things as they come from a great motive. So as for the glory of God. 
Do the little things for the glory of God to win his smile of approval and to do good to others, our fellow human beings. See, it is way harder to trudge along in obscurity doing things for the glory of God than it is to stand on the mountaintop so that everyone can see you and do mighty acts of valor while rival armies stare at you. But there is no holy action. No matter how small that goes without swift recognition and the ultimate reward of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, to faithfully fulfill the duties of your position, to use the gifts of your ministry to their maximum potential, to bear abrasive frustrations and minor irritations just like the martyrs before us who took the ridicule and the persecution. I don't want Jesus to have any confusion about who I belong to when I stand before him on that day. Do these things, and I just, just write these down quickly. Do these things. Look for the one good thing in others who try to mistreat you. Look for the one good thing. Respond with the kindest face to the unkind acts and words. Look for the one good thing. Respond with the kindest face. Give of your best to the least. Give of your best to the least. And love with the love of God. You can't do it on your own. See, in the middle of the dry valley of stones, we need to be content. Be content to be a fountain. In the middle of the dry valley of stones, nourishing just a, just a few lichens, just a, a stray flower, or maybe a, a, a sheep, a thirsty sheep. But do this always, not for the praise of others, but do these small things one day at a time for the glory of God, for the audience of one, for His approval. Folks, that is true greatness. Doing it for the glory of God. That's what makes a truly great life. We see in verse 42, many believed in him there. That's it. This was the final exposure publicly. Jesus stayed out there with his disciples and with these gathered believers until he went back into Jerusalem to die. And the compelling question is this. Do you believe. Do you believe the works of Jesus as being supernatural? Because that's not debatable. He turned the water into wine. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He did these things showing that He is the Son of God. If they're supernatural, then they either came from heaven or they came from hell because they're not from this world. Do you believe that Jesus is an agent of Satan? If not, then he must be an agent from God. He had to be from God. And if he is of God, if he is God, then he must, you must believe that he is who he claimed to be. It's blasphemy to deny him, to reject him, and it cuts you off from eternal life. See, if you believe... If you believe that He is the Son of God, then you receive eternal salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, a place in God's family, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of heavenly glory, everlasting joy. See, all of these wonderful benefits come with believing in Jesus Christ. But it starts with believing in Him as the Son of God. Folks, that's the gospel. I can't make it any plainer. We must believe in Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross. See, that's, that's the Christian message. That's the gospel. It comes from Scripture. And Scripture always, always 
always tells the truth. Let's pray. Loving Father, I thank You for this time. I thank You for Your Word. I thank You that Your Word is truth. Father, in a time when we are lied to about many things, Father, in a time when we don't know who we can trust, Father, in a day of confusion, in a day of darkness, in a day when all around us people are floundering, groping to find the truth. Father, we have the truth. Father, you have given us the way, the truth, and the life. Father, I ask that you would convict our hearts. Father, that you would examine our lives when we have not been faithful to you. Father, when we have rejected Jesus in our decisions, in our sorrows. Father, when we have rejected him when he wanted to help us with our burdens. Father, I pray that you would forgive us when we haven't been the witness that we need to be. Father, I pray that we would be like John, that we would be a a true and faithful witness to Jesus Christ. That in that moment, in that hour, when people are standing before us, we would give them the truth of who Jesus is. So that, Father, when we are gone, when we are no longer here, they will say, he or she spoke the truth about Jesus. And that many would believe in you. Father, I pray that you would find us faithful. Father, I don't pray that we would be found rich. I don't pray that we would be found smart. I don't pray that we would be found clever or anything else. I pray that we would be found faithful to you in our witness. God, I ask that you would do this for your glory for your praise, and for your honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.